Win a thousand. We're open till midnight, till Sunday at Bridgeport Carpets, number five road, Richmond. Porter just bought a computer to solve his problems. Instead, it multiplied them because he didn't buy it from Computerland. At Computerland, you'll find the most respected computer systems in the business, featuring Apple, IBM, and Compaq, plus the works free. A 10-point package that guarantees you'll get the right computer for your needs, available exclusively at Computerland. Computerland. There's only one number one. Good morning. I just can't resist this opening because those who know me will confirm I am extremely gregarious. I meet and talk to people on the streets, in the markets, in the shops, in the restaurants, and in the bars. I invite them to my house, I go to their house. The door to my house is usually unlocked and frequently open. That is my way. I admit I am unconventional. I also invite people into my studio to cross-question them endlessly in a nagging, horrible manner and let those who seek to profit by their wickedness just take their chances. Now, that is not really my statement. I was wondering yesterday when I read it, when I saw it on Hatfield's prepared television thing, if Dalton Camp had actually written it, because Dalton Camp, of course, has been the greatest and strongest defender of the propriety of almost everything that Hatfield is accused of. Now, purely coincidental and an absolutely irrelevant mention is that Camp yesterday picked up a $30 million advertising contract with the Conservative government in Ottawa. Well, that's good. He's a very good advertising man. Now, the object of my exercise today is to continue with a proper examination of whether or not the Tory government is really in trouble over the Hatfield capers. Must this man, Elmer McKay, the Solicitor General, resign in all propriety? Well, to put you into the picture again, we must show you what happened yesterday in the House of Commons. He in particular confirmed that the Solicitor General invited the Premier of New Brunswick to his home for that meeting, despite his earlier assurances that this meeting should in fact be held on neutral ground. The Premier is wrong in his, uh, in his recollection that I invited him to my home, and uh, I have, uh, I have nothing, uh, nothing further to say about that conversation other than uh, that I still regard it as being a... a uh, confidential and privileged conversation. Will the Solicitor General come to the defense of the RCMP and ensure that the integrity of the RCMP is maintained and call for a judicial inquiry to clear his name and the good name of the RCMP? Yeah. They themselves requested an internal review. This internal review was promised in November. It's now underway. And when it is finished, if there are any changes required in the practices and procedures of the RCMP, they will be announced in due course. The question on which I want to get an opinion this morning from one of the fiercest critics of what's happened in Ottawa and New Brunswick lately, I'm going to put to the former Liberal Solicitor General, uh, Robert Kaplan. Now, as you well know, liberals hereabouts, no matter how right their cause might be, are apt to get a bad time. And as Turner was reminded the other day, the liberals are still held in very low regard by many callers to this program. We'll see how Kaplan survives under the attack this morning after I've milked him, if I may, on whether or not Elmer McKay must be fired or resign after the break. Thing ...and resign his seat immediately to maintain the integrity of our criminal justice system. I've listened carefully to my honourable friend's questions, the several questions, and the answer to each one of them is no. Yes. I'm a man of honour. The liberal case is that the Solicitor General, Elmer McKay, is in an embarrassed position whereby he must resign. 
all arising, as you know, out of the charge and the acquittal of Richard Hatfield, the Premier of New Brunswick, for the possession of marijuana and that grossly embarrassing business of marijuana in a suitcase on the plane of Her Majesty the Queen. Now, Bob Kaplan was Solicitor General for how many years in the Liberal government? Five. And you will admit to me, will you not witness that the Liberal government, will you not witness, <laughs> that the Liberal government was sorely embarrassed by its own scandals? Well, we had a number of situations on which ministers offered to resign and did resign. And yet now you have the gall to sit there and prate on the highest possible principles of public morality that these dreadful Tories should decimate themselves because of their minor derelictions of duty. Well, I think it's more than minor. Uh, the meeting took place, we know that, although at first Mr. McKay wouldn't admit it. And after it was discovered that it took place, he refused to say what happened at it. He refuses to tell us whether he discussed it with Mr. Crosby, hiding behind cabinet confidence and saying that he won't tell. To me, that meeting could go if Elmer McKay apologized for it and said it was a mistake of judgment and maybe offered to resign and the Prime Minister refused it, saying he's a new boy. But what he has said is that he intends to have meetings like that and he's going to consider meeting regularly. Let me start again. Give me your case from the very top, taking whatever time you need to document why McKay is in trouble. I can see why Hatfield yeah. is, is a real problem for the nation at the moment because he has chosen not to defend himself properly against all these charges beyond yeah. the cocaine, because beyond the uh, acquittal and possession of marijuana. But you give me the case as you see it, as a former Solicitor General, on just precisely what um, Elmer McKay has done yeah. wrong. Well, I'm not on Mr. Hadfield's case. He was acquitted, and I've read the transcript, and I'm satisfied with that judgment. What I am troubled by and find unacceptable is the idea that a Solicitor General, who has the authority under law to give direction to the RCMP in any lawful matter, like continuing a prosecution or not continuing a prosecution, how it should be conducted, that a person with that power would go into a secret meeting which he called to be on neutral territory on a Sunday night in a hotel suite and allow himself to get into a situation like that where anyone in the country is entitled to conclude and I think they are entitled to conclude that something happened which could have been improper that the system of justice was brought into disrepute by agreeing to a meeting like that and by having a meeting like that. What were the stages of McKay's admission that there was a meeting? As I recall, first of all, when he yeah. was asked by the press if he had met with Hatfield, he said, no comment. He said no comment. You know, it wouldn't have occurred to me that he would have had a meeting like that because a meeting like that is, is so inappropriate and especially a secret meeting. All right, if a man complains that the Mounties are giving him a hard time, and you're willing to meet with him about it and that it's unfair and so on, you should have your deputy there, you should have the commissioner there for protection so that the public will know that nothing improper took place at that meeting. And having said no comment, he later admitted to That's the press right. that there had been a meeting. That's right. He said there had been a meeting, but he wouldn't say what happened at it. Well, now Mr. Hatfield is saying what happened at it and how it was set up, and Mr. McKay is prepared to contradict him. That's what he did on the tape you just showed. You're saying Mr. Hatfield said that he first of all invited me to his home. That's right. Which is, I saw that the original tape yesterday, and McKay says that Mr. Hatfield yeah. is mistaken. Yeah. Jack, let me put it into a kind of a, uh, there's a question you can ask that shows unequivocally how wrong a meeting like that is in principle. What would have happened if the Mounties had decided on their own not to charge Mr. Hatfield after that meeting had occurred? Let's say that they recognized that the court would be troubled by the zipper and the unzipper on the suitcase, that the continuity wasn't established, and they had decided, well, we're just not going to charge this guy. Now, if it then came out that before that, this secret meeting had taken place, imagine what a scandal that oh, would yes, have been. Oh, yes, the imputation and the innuendo and exactly. the, so, I mean, that, be that the Solicitor General had said to the RCMP, don't Leia, charge. Leia. Well, that, that's exactly why a Solicitor General must not get himself into a position like that, of a secret meeting with a man he likes at night, in a weekend, in a hotel room, on what he considered neutral territory. I mean, what does neutral territory mean to Mr. McKay? That he can step outside of his responsibilities by going to some place that he considers neutral? Would it have been improper in his office to have a meeting like that? Is that what neutral territory means? It's unacceptable to me, and the idea 
that this government intends to permit the Solicitor General to meet with, the, with people under investigation when he feels, without telling us the cr criteria now, but when he feels it's proper to do so, has brought the system of justice into disrepute. And he has no alternative but to renounce that policy for the government, that's Mr. Mulroney, and for Mr. McKay, who believes in that kind of a meeting, to resign. Hatfield brought forth another defense of his, <laughs> of his seeking of the meeting with Elmer McKay. And that was, if he, he said to Pamela Wallen, if I had been charged within 48 hours in, the normal, in a normal manner, I would not have sought the meeting. But this had been going on for so long, I felt that I should go and say, why are the RCMP hounding me? Or what's to that effect? Did he not have a case to do that? Well, I don't know what happened at that meeting. I hear what Mr. Hadfield is saying now, and I think it's very important for Mr. McKay to give us his version of what happened because, you know, they, as I said before, they've already disagreed about one aspect of the meeting. Now, this is what Mr. Hadfield said happened at the meeting. I'd like to know what Mr. McKay says happened at the meeting. But the more you ask about it, however much the answers are exculpatory, even if they're conflicting, it just underlines again and again the impropriety of the man in charge of the RCMP stepping in and meeting with someone under investigation. I want to find out from you the actual powers of the RCMP charge to charge because there's considerable confusion on this. Yeah. But what is your position now? That if McKay admitted his impropriety, you would call it that, mm -hmm. what should he do? Submit? Well. I think that it was a mistake of judgment. Now, a mistake of judgment sometimes requires a resignation, and sometimes the Prime Minister can give a reprimand or something like that and let it go. But it's much more serious than that at this point, because the man is not admitting a mistake of judgment. He's saying that he feels justified in meeting with people under investigation. And you know, he's put forward three different theories for it. At one point, he said, when a Premier wants to meet me, I have to meet him even if I know that the meeting is about an investigation. That shows special treatment and McKay actually advanced that as the justification for it, that a premier under investigation is entitled to special treatment. That's wrong and totally. unacceptable. Theory number two was that uh, he'd meet with anybody. Well, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of people who have convictions for possession of a small amount of marijuana. And is he saying he's available for Sunday night meetings was with everybody you? in the country? Was it you who asked the question in the House if Hatfield had met with Mulroney? Yes, I did. What was the answer to that? The answer was a categorical denial by the Prime Minister, unless he said it was in the course of some other official activity that he might have bumped into him about it. So it's not really satisfactorily answered, but I, of course, if the if it's categorically denied in the House of Commons, a member of the opposition accepts it. Must accept it. Must accept it. Yeah. This guy known Ziata as a find, isn't he? As a troublemaker. <laughs> well, he was a real tough counselor on a municipality in Toronto, and he's, he got very well known. He's got a lot of guts. And uh, he's, you know, he's taken some risks because uh, he's said things that he believed were true. Uh, and if they had been denied on the other side, he would have had trouble substantiating them, even though he knew they were true. But as things have worked out, I think Mr. Nunciata's uh, courage has been validated. More with Bob Kaplan, the former Liberal Solicitor General, after the break. Well, now that you've been categorized as a sleazebag yeah. by, Cros by Crosby, right. correct? Yeah. <clears throat> when you were Solicitor General, did you have any information relating to Hatfield's extremely gregarious nature? Well, certainly none as Solicitor General, but I knew from uh, the Tory group uh, what sort of a uh, freewheeling operator that he was. Disco Dick. Yeah, and you know what I have to say about that is a person who does that in public life takes the risk that a person is going to go to one of these parties that he opens his doors for and come out and say what they like and he is going to have to defend himself. I mean that's why other people in public life are more restrained. It's not because we're not gregarious. I'd, be, you know, I'd enjoy uh, meeting strangers and getting around but you just don't take chances like that when you're a custodian of public trust. Uh, is there a, po a really important point of public morality involved in all of this? Now, I know you don't want to talk about Hatfield, yeah. but uh, you're, going to, you're going to be asked about it all across the country anyway. 
But here's a man who refuses to take full advantage of defending himself against most serious charges. I mean, these, whether they came from a lake or whether they came from the mountains, they are serious, really serious charges. Now, if Hatfield stays in power or if Mackay doesn't have to resign, are we not slicing away at the best standards of political morality at which we should aim? Oh, I don't know. The things that he's admitted that he has done in the statement that he made don't trouble me at all. I don't see anything wrong with doing that. But you do take very big risks when you do it. You open your doors to strangers. You have someone in your house and, you know, he said, this man, these men were strangers to me. Well, you know, then when they go out and they say what happened, and when he's he got to defend himself. So it's not a matter of morality, unless, of course, the allegations are true. If those young men's allegations are true about what happened at the party, and, you know, we don't know whether they're true or not, but if they are true, then I think uh, that does affect public morality. Because, you know, if you've got teenage children around and other people and you're talking about the use of drugs, uh, I think it's important that leaders in public life set an example. When he says, too, to those who sought to profit by their wickedness, they know, they should know they have failed. Yeah. And when he says particularly the RCMP bad eggs leaked information to embarrass him, surely yeah. to goodness we must have a full public inquiry to yes. find out these RCMP bad eggs or to find out if he's accusing uh, Nick Hills of Southern yeah. News with a brown paper envelope yeah. apparently or Jeffrey Stevens of the Globe and Mail of a deliberate attempt to destroy a public figure yeah. unfairly and maliciously. Should we not have a real public inquiry? Well that has been the thrust of our demand about the meeting and uh, what Mr. Hadfield said in, on television was that he is the victim of a conspiracy. A conspiracy in which the RCMP and members of the RCMP are involved. And you know, his Minister of Justice, I don't know if it was reported out here, but the Minister of Justice said that there were Mounties who were using their positions as Mounties to bring down the New Brunswick government. Well, you know, the New Brunswick government has begun to build up a provincial police force on it, of their own, that not using the RCMP, and they're cutting back a bit on the RCMP provincial policing. So there's a color of substance to it that makes you want to defend it. I don't believe his allegations, I must say. But if there is a basis for them, and it seems that there is, I don't see an alternative but having a public inquiry. Now, back to my point. Where a public official, a cabinet minister, or a provincial premier, is accused of a grossly serious breach from whatever quarter, if there's any substance at all to it, should that not that minister say, I'm under a cloud? I wish you to put me on the sidelines until I am properly and thoroughly clear. Is that not the way our system is supposed to work? Well, I wouldn't agree completely with that. And I think that, there, that it's up to the minister and it's up to his prime minister whether they're willing to sustain the continual damage. If Coates, for example, had wanted to validate that night's affair, in the West Germany and say that it was no worse than some bars here in Vancouver and he didn't take documents in and so on, I would have expected his leader to stick up for him. You know, Mr. Trudeau did that when a minister was under uh, allegations that uh, he considered unfounded or distorted and he was able to convince Mr. Trudeau that he deserved a chance to defend himself. So I wouldn't go as far as to say that uh, whenever serious allegations are made with some substantiation that you've got to step out of public life. But you do have to expect a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Trudeau expected a lot of On damage. On the court's <laughs> affair, it's, it's certainly uh, uh, Mr. Trudeau suffered a lot of damage. <laughs> well, he did. He would stand behind ministers in circumstances where another guy, like Mulroney, in connection with Coates, I mean, they just accepted the resignation. That's why one has to wonder what the real reason was for his departure. You they know, accepted my, the resignation at the very my moment. My theory of the reason for the departure is because Coates has been going around saying that a lot more money is going to be spent by the new government on national defense. And I don't think the money will be provided by that government or by Mr. Wilson, the Minister of Finance. So I think when a little thing came along that justified Coates' departure, that Mulroney grabbed it because now they don't have to live up to the commitment that that minister made 
to Casper Weinberger in the States that we would be building up our national defense. You're saying that Mulroney took the opportunity of this minor, perhaps, embarrassment to coach to say, hey, here's a good chance to get rid of this. I would have stuck up for a prime minister. You know, if I had been the prime minister and all that was there was what is on the record, and if this bar girl is telling the truth that there were no documents and that he just stayed for a drink and left, you know, I might have been inclined to stick up for my minister in a case like that. National defense is very sensitive. That, that is a I'll bet you there's some kind you know, of NATO intelligence report that there was somebody in that part at that time who was a character of whom NATO had suspicions. That well, would have it be. Yeah, but you know, they didn't get a report from NATO. When they did the security clearance, the NATO officials say that no check was done with them. The people who work in the bar say that when this so-called security clearance was obtained, no check was done with them. So I don't know what kind of security check was done, but you know, my suspicion as someone who's been in public life for a while is that there are other reasons for the Coates' departure and, and not necessarily having to do with his character. I don't know much Having about to that. do perhaps with his, uh, his uh, position and his appearance as defense minister. Well, and, yeah, and the kinds of policies that he was leaking, that he wanted before they were approved by the Minister of Finance. You can have at Bob Kaplan on this very shortly. I've just got a couple of points more to raise with him on the powers of the RCMP to charge in certain circumstances after the break. I want to pick your brains on what you regard as the responsibility of the Commissioner of the RCMP. I vaguely, you know, shuddered when I saw the Commissioner coming out and kind of defending the government in this particular situation. And he said that um, he uh, they did not in any way interfered with what I call police independence or police discretion. What is the position with the RCMP and the Solicitor General? Who has the final word? Can the Solicitor General t say to the RCMP, uh, that's a friend of mine, don't lay a charge. Well, in fact, uh, I believe that the Solicitor General does have that power, but that it's a power that he should be accountable for if he ever uses it. Now, <clears throat> what, uh, if the Commissioner of the RCMP gets an order from the Solicitor General to do something illegal, like uh, send your men to beat up so-and-so, he has a duty to refuse it and not to obey it. But if the Solicitor General gives him an order which is lawful, remember the RCMP Act gives the Solicitor General the authority to direct the Commissioner in anything that the Commissioner has the responsibility to do. So laying of charges and so on is an area, and investigations is an area where I believe the Solicitor General should have the authority. Now I heard last week a statement attributed to the Commissioner that he disagrees with that. But if the commissioner in feels... In fact, the commissioner said that I, if he had been told not to lay the charge, he would have proceeded with the investigation and charged well, anyway. Well, I, what I fear, that kind of a statement means that we live in a police state. Because my theory is, and I believe this is the tradition, <clears throat> that if the Solicitor General gives an order which is lawful, but which is improper, like lay off my brother-in-law or don't charge Hatfield or something like that, then the commissioner's recourse, if he doesn't like the order, is to go to the PM and say, look, your, uh, your solicitor general is asking me to do something that I consider to be improper. Should I do it? And the PM has, can say, well, uh, tell the, I'll, I'll tell the solicitor general not to order, give you that order, or I'll fire the solicitor general, or I agree with the solicitor general, do what he says. And in a case like that, I know from what Commissioner Simmons has said and from my long working, good working relationship with him, that he would resign. He wouldn't accept it. And that is the way in which the public interest is protected. It's not by having an RCMP that can go on disobeying the government if the government is giving them lawful orders. You, know, you make that, a good point there that yeah. if, the, <laughs> if the RCMP take an improper order from the Solicitor General who is their legal commanding officer. He is the final civilian authority. The Commissioner is not the final civilian authority. And of course we must have a final civilian authority. I think so. And if it's correct that Simmons seemed to indicate that he can refuse to do something from the RCMP, we are a bit mm -hmm. of a police state. From the Solicitor General? Well, it's theoretical, you know, because it didn't happen and the Commissioner gave us the assurance, but it's very important to have that clear. No, no, it's very important. And I'm yeah. at the risk of boring people to death, I'm going to go one step further. Yeah. If I am an RCMP officer anywhere in Canada and I decide there's information to lay a charge, 
can I lay it or must I take direction in a drug prosecution yeah. from the Minister of Justice? Well, I think you should get advice. And that, of course, is what the whole structure is set up to provide, including legal advice from the law officers of the Crown. But if you have the criminal code in your hand, and you have, this is what, as I understand the British tradition to be, and you have reasonable ground to believe that an offense has been committed, you lay the charge. And if the prosecutors have been telling you, forget it, it's not going to work, we're going to lose, they come in later, after the charge is laid, because under the criminal code they can stay proceedings, they don't have to proceed with the case if they don't agree with it. But again, the safeguard, so that the public will know that the right thing is being done, is that the policeman is independent to make that decision on his own, if he has reasonable ground to believe. I don't think that's the case, certainly not in the city of Vancouver, the city police. I'm quite confident that I can say to you that in the city police, that the prosecutors, the Crown Council, decide whether or not a charge of any substance is going to be yeah. made. So that technically could be wrong, couldn't it? Technically. Well, it's, a, it's an issue on which there's a, there are two views. Some uh, attorneys general in this country do feel that they can tell the police, uh, lay off so-and-so or don't. You see, this is the prosecutorial authority we're talking about, and I don't believe the prosecutorial authority extends that far. Otherwise, the public has no way of knowing whether there's been some interference in the exercise by the police of their judgment. You're saying it is the duty of a seasoned police officer with a proper authority, having looked at the offense and the evidence, to say, I'm going to sign an information. Well, let me, to prove my position, I'll point out to you that any citizen can lay a charge. So you're saying that a policeman, because he's a policeman, has somehow or other a reduced power that an ordinary citizen has to lay a charge? See, I don't... That, that to me, is the kind of final authority, proof that it's up to the policeman to decide what he thinks is right. You make a very good case for a national police force and not to let it slip back into what was certainly a bit of a shocker here when we had a provincial police force. Well, I have noted in some provinces this tendency of the Attorney General to give the police instructions. You know, in Alberta, it was done recently. The, the, the minister put out a directive saying that if any police were contemplating laying charges against senior officials or cabinet ministers, he wanted to be informed about it, and he was sort of wanting to take control of that. We have never done that in the federal sphere, and as I say, I don't think it's right. I'm not saying it's illegal. We're not talking here about the law. Listen, We're talking about public safeguards. You're, all you're doing this morning is continuing my uh, ad hoc legal education. But uh, meanwhile, of course, you're terribly embarrassed. Your party's in an absolute shambles. You don't want Turner. You'll be attacked on your own <laughs> Francis Fox case and Margaret Tudor smoking dope in her book and whatnot and incense. You know, how can you stand holier than thou with that halo around your holier than us with that halo around your head saying the Tories who've been guilty of some sloppiness? Well, listen, if only perfect people could take on the government, then the government would have an unlimited license. Our duty is, I know we got some, some scars. I don't agree with uh, all your charges, I have to say. I'm only reflecting but, the public hostility to the Liberal I Party. Know, but it's, that has nothing to do with our duty to provide effective opposition to the government. Let's see what you've got to say to Bob Kaplan, Solicitor General. We haven't even touched the parole board or any of that nonsense, <laughs> have we? We're not no. going to either no. after the break. Well, let's throw Bob Kaplan to the wolves, if it's anything like the Turner program the other day. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Mr. Kaplan, I uh, think it would have been uh, it would have been mildly amusing to me if uh, Mr. McKay had been forced to resign because he would have been a victim of the marijuana laws. Uh, I oh. think uh, if we'd have listened to the if we'd have implemented the recommendations of the Ladane Commission. Ten years ago. Okay, oh. you've got your question. Why did you not implement the recommendations of the Ladane Commission? Well, because we disagreed with them. Ladane, remember, was recommending that the use of marijuana should be legal, and he never dealt with the problem of distribution, how you would get it from the organized crime into the hands of the consumer. But uh, we disagreed with it because we don't think it should be legal, and I still don't think it should. And you're certainly not going to have government marijuana farms to keep it under control and sold in packages in the liquor stores. Yeah. Eh? These guys, well, these normal people, I must confess, 
manage to get on the program all the time, and they know how much I hate them and despise yeah. them and detest them and, you know, just can't stand them. Yeah, I, I don't hold McKay a, a, accountable in connection with the marijuana no, thing. No, For me, not. it's the administration of justice issue. Yeah. Go ahead, please, from Abbotsford. Yes, uh, I want to talk about a different subject and ask, ask a question. It still comes under the Solicitor General. Uh, when you were Solicitor General, uh, as far as I can determine, you did very little about the Nazi war criminals living in Canada. Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Well, I hope you'll let me answer it, too. Because, well, we'll, we'll yeah. get his question first. As you know, anti-Semitism at this point in time is running rampant. Worst, I would say, from since, since the war. And I feel, feel that you have done very little in that field. And I would like to know why. And uh, I'll wait and listen. Thank you. Well, I am the person who began an effective first policy for dealing with war criminals in Canada and bringing them to justice. And I did that very deliberately in my first month as Solicitor General. When was that? Uh, well, it was just uh, starting in April, right at the early part of 1981. And uh, I took it to cabinet, got a cabinet decision supportive of bringing them to justice. The difficulty that we've had is that the only thing we could find to do in the laws that we had at first was extradition. And so I went to some foreign governments. I urged them to uh, bring extradition requests. I told them that whatever had happened in the past, if they brought them again, that they would receive a positive response and police resources would be allocated. And they were. And you know, ever since then, there have been, uh, during my years, there was a dedicated group within the RCMP trying to pursue war criminals. How the, big was that dedicated <coughs> group? Well, on the day that I left, there were three in, the, uh, in Ottawa who were working full time on it. But when allegations were made about uh, v fugitives being in particular cities, the RCMP in those cities would follow up. And if you look in the RCMP manual now, you'll find a section on war criminals telling the RCMP what the policy is and how to deal with allegations so that are made by citizens. So therefore, I'd be correct in saying that since 1981, <laughs> the war ended in 1945, 40, 45. Since yeah. 1981, the governments of Canada, Tory and Liberal, mostly Liberal, have made a feeble, belated effort to attempt to track down some of the 20,000 yeah. <clears throat> war criminals from all over Eastern Europe and Germany who are in this country now. Is that correct? Well, I don't agree with that figure of 20,000. I've never heard that high a figure. But let me just say this. I regret a lot that only one case surfaced and got to the stage of going to court. In West Germany, the average time that a case takes is about eight years before a final judgment has been obtained in it. But I, I can say, and I say this with some personal satisfaction, that there are active files still under investigation. And I expect some of them will lead to more extradition requests and also to, uh, to citizenship being taken away. But I can't get away from the uneasy feeling that for 20, <coughs> 25, 30 years, the Canadian government's just sat there and that we could well be, have been a haven. Look at Mengele making an apparent yeah. application and his yeah. name is, is Elias, which was Menke, I think, not even being spotted. I mean, yeah. are you not ashamed as a Canadian? of the pathetic efforts we have done to roust war criminals since 45, 46. Well, I am ashamed of it, but it's one of the reasons I went into public life. I mean, that was one of the things I wanted to achieve. I introduced bills on the subject when I was a backbencher. I raised it in party caucuses, and when I got to be a minister, we changed our policy and we started doing something about it. Now, only one case, as I say, got completely through that very small door that mm -hmm. you have to get through to comply with the rule of law and so on. But as I say, I expect others, and I, I'll be pleased when they happen. Go ahead, please. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I, I'd like to say basically that I, I agree with uh, Mr. Kaplan's basic conception of how this situation should have been handled. And I certainly uh, have no love for conservative uh, philosophy in general or the conservative party. But regarding Hatfield, it, it, seems, that, it seems that everything I've heard the, the few flashes that I have heard, and I don't know too much about New Brunswick politics, but what I have heard about him as far as the uh, rank and file uh, Acadian blue collar citizenry or what have you, is that they seem to be uh, backing him to the hilt. And I just wonder, I just wonder, uh, you know, like it's, uh, it seems kind of peculiar. It, it seems uh, for, for any uh, premier or, or politician in this country, 
at this stage of the game with unemployment and whatnot to, to get that kind of support to certainly have been You're saying, what, what's his status in New yeah. Brunswick? You're well, gone he, yeah. forever to say it, but you're saying, why do you love him so much in yeah. New Brunswick? Well, he has had some tremendous achievements. He's a very courageous political leader, and he's made an important contribution to our country. And I guess he felt that this unconventional lifestyle would be accepted by people, and he could be right. He could very well be he right. He could probably win an but, election in New Brunswick but, today. Yeah, but my cause is not against Hatfield, except that I don't think you should have asked for that meeting with McKay. My cause is against a, the government of Canada, which now believes that that type of meeting is acceptable. It's proper. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. <clears throat> uh, Jack, I'd like to ask Mr. Kaplan a question. Carry on. Yeah. Uh, Come on. Uh, well, I'd like to know how much money of our tax dollars are being directed to, to this coverage on Mr. Hatfield. That's a silly question. Yeah. Silly question. I'll, I'll put that question on the order paper for the House of Commons <laughs> when I get back and see if the government will tell us. Go ahead. I hope, I hope Mr. Camp's contract didn't include the statements that he made on behalf of Hatfield in the last few days. $50 million. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. That's a federal government advertising contract or something. That's right. Yeah. Great. Dalton. Yeah. I thought he was in the outs. He was a guy, what was he did? He Diefenbaker. He destroyed Diefenbaker. Yeah, and uh, he was always considered a pariah, pretty unfairly, I thought, because he was a guy with a lot of courage. But he seems to be back in everybody's good graces now. Not in mine. And, well, he's got a good con He's got a very good head on his shoulders. Oh, I know he has. He, really he and I just don't happen to see eye to eye. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Mr. Kaplan. Yeah. Keep, a, keep up the good work for the... Uh, Conservatives will be as rotten as the BC soap rates. <laughs> now well, you're going to mention we the got liberals. A, we got a job to do. Go ahead, please. <coughs> oh, yes. Good morning, Mr. Kaplan. Good morning, Good morning, Jack. I'd like to know what is the process in, in a place in a case like uh, Premier Hatfield? Who selects the judge that's going to hear the case? Uh, uh, normally, I can, I, actually, I'm not an authority on New Brunswick, but the normal rule is that the chief of the court assigns cases among various judges. A, a chief justice may spend as much as half his time on administration, you know, deciding who gets cases. And he'll take account of sensitivities, you know, like if it's a tax case or a complicated one, he knows a judge who's good at that. Or if the judge is a former partner of someone who's involved in a case, he'll assign the case to somebody else. And it's, a, it's not a difficult job to do, but it's a sensitive job. I thought it was quite appalling where that judge, uh, by clear innuendo, accused Ryan, a television reporter, of planting the marijuana in the bag. Yeah. And of course, Ryan had no answer because judges and yeah. uh, have the full right and full protection of whatever they wish to say in court. Isn't yeah, that right? That's right. And what uh, we're seeing now is the need in that particular province for something like a judicial council because I don't think it's up to ministers to criticize the judges. You know, when Crosby said he considered the judgment unusual and unfair and so on in that respect, I don't think uh, the Attorney General should send signals like that to people on the bench. The accountability should be there, but it should be the Judicial Council that does well, it. We've, we have public opinion. We, of know? course, have a Judicial Council provincially in British yeah. Columbia, and I wouldn't dare involve you in it. But my opinion <laughs> of it is that certainly in the past it has been a complete failure. Yeah. Well, and it's I public accountability that's the final answer. I mean, we are a well-informed electorate in this country. I think Canadians are fair-minded, and I think the final accountability is to the people. More with Bob Kaplan after the break. <laughs> Go ahead to Robert Kaplan, former Liberal Solicitor General, now in the unusual position of standing on the other side of the house and nagging. It must be very different. <laughs> it certainly is different. Is it fun? Yeah, it's fun. Go ahead, please. Right. Uh, congratulations, Mr. Kaplan, to ask you for the actions you're taking. It's interesting to note that uh, Mr. Crosby referred to some of the attackers as sleazebags. And in yeah. fact, when the Conservatives were in opposition, Elmer McKay was the sleazebag who was turning a digging in the dirt to try and muck all the muckraking that he could yeah, to try and bring fact. down the liberals. Well, that's true, you know, and uh, th they used to make all kinds of allegations that turned out to be unfounded. Here, where we're saying a meeting took place that actually did, I don't think they're entitled to call us sleazebags. What was McKay's uh, principal line of attack on you? I forget. Something to do with the RCMP. Oh, gosh, there were so many over the years. He's a kind of a detective approach to his responsibilities. Go ahead, yeah. please. 
Yeah, good morning, uh, Jack. Uh, good morning, Mr. Kaplan. Good morning. Uh, before I ask a question, I would just say that your image on the television is far better than it comes across in the television in the, in the House of the Parliament. <laughs> I used to think you were a bit of an ogre, but you seem to be a nice guy. <laughs> well, uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the question I wanted to ask was, uh, why was it necessary to uh, form a secret police force uh, outside the jurisdiction of the RCFP? And, well, uh, you know, well, I think people are getting rather suspicious of these moves by the government. Yeah. So uh, the con increasing use of computers to keep tabs <laughs> on people, and, and, this, and now followed up by a secret police force. It has an yeah. insidious yeah. uh, sort of... Uh, uh, Ring to it. Yeah. That's a good question. Well, they're basically doing the same job that the security service was supposed to be doing inside the RCMP, taking account of the criticisms of uh, the McDonald Commission. But the main difference is that now where they are outside the RCMP, they're under a review committee that is made up of uh, one liberal, I think four, three conservatives and one NDPer who are outside the political process now and who act as a kind of a watchdog group over them to make sure that they're complying with the law and that they're not abusing their authority. Will this review committee have total access to their function? Absolutely. They have the authority. It's not like the Congressional Review Committee. This committee has the authority to walk into any part of the headquarters, to look in any files, to call on anyone from the service and ask them questions, so that there's that public assurance now uh, that, the, that they are actually complying with their mandate. Well, you I see, with the police, you don't want that kind of oversight with the police. I mean, it's not appropriate to have a police Correct. reviewed in that way. They should do what they think is right, but in the area of the security service, you want that extra accountability. Well, maybe I've been listening to Sven Robinson too much, and I do that only when I can't avoid it. Uh, mm -hmm. But are you telling me there is an independent review committee of members of the House of Parliament who have total access? No, they're not, they're not MPs. They are uh, former, I think uh, three of them are former MPs. Saul Cherniak is one. Oh, yeah. Ron Atke is one. Uh, Frank McGee from Toronto is one. A civilian uh, review J.J. Blair, who's a retired former Liberal minister. And they meet regularly and review all of the activities of the service. Who reports the House of Commons to? The minister. The minister, uh, but, but they, 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 they make a report which they write themselves and they submit, they're supposed to submit it Because as you know, to the old comments. timers in the RCMP felt yeah. that the greatest weakness of your secret, uh, your new secret intelligence service was the fact that it would be much easier to be infiltrated by a Cambridge graduates. Well, that uh, McDonald, the, uh, the, the original Royal Commission recommended, recognized that too, but there's answers to that. You know, you just have extra safe precautions on deciding mm -hmm. who to hire. I think everybody spies for everybody else, <laughs> but I've read a lot of novels on it. Go ahead, please. Your, your arguments uh, regarding McKay uh, sound reasonable, but what uh, bothers me a little bit is uh, why did the prosecution decide not to appeal the Hatfield's uh, case? And, um, and another I, I, question is, uh, was the judge that uh, presided appointed by Hatfield and was he a personal friend and should the judge have disqualified himself? And uh, um, yeah. Hatfield stands a long shot of being actually uh, framed because, um, well, not because, but in, in McLean's uh, story on, on the subject, yeah. uh, he mentioned uh, uh, Dalgeed or uh, uh, one of the students, what's the name? That? Diggler. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And uh, yeah, the yeah. leader of the liberal uh, uh, opposition has the same name. The same name. Has right? the same name. <laughs> I, I spotted uh, yeah. that in McLean's, Digley, well, one of yeah. the students, and Digley, but there's no connection made in the audience. Well, I haven't seen it, and in French-Canadian society, there are a lot of duplications of names. There's so many names that are like Smith in English that... What about the appeal, which Cosby said we ain't going to yeah. appeal? Well, there were, there were grounds for appeal, but again, he says that he was acting on the advice of officials not to appeal, and I accept that. More with Bob Kaplan. And also, so far as the judge is concerned, too, I, I have no basis for criticizing the independence of the judge. They had one other judge in mind, and that judge withdrew, do you remember, because he felt public, serve, public officials should get tougher punishments. And, that and he also accused the yeah. CBC and Globe and Mail and everybody else of twisting a lengthy interview into an unfair interview, yeah. putting him in a bad public light. After the break. Go ahead from Victoria, please. I'm uh, 
calling regarding the appointment to the bench, not uh, as the creation of a lawyer, of Mr. Harrigan in this uh, fair and unbiased trial. Oh, yeah. Did the Hatfield government not uh, create him a judge? Yes, he's one of the provincial judges, and he was appointed by the province, but uh, that is our system, and I don't have any uh, complaint about that. What, what are you getting at, that the judges should come from some other source than provincial? provincial? Yeah. Mr. Harrigan not in effect trying his benefactor? Well, but we expect our judges when they go on the bench to be independent, and I think we're pretty well served by it. I, I wouldn't say that... No, uh, they're, they're not yeah. anointed by God. That they're yeah, not, I know. No. I, we had a ludicrous situation here the other yeah. day where a provincial court judge threw out a charge because the man made the case that the, he couldn't be fairly trialed by a provincial judge appointed by the Attorney General who was so deeply involved in all the caper. Yeah. Nonsense. We, we, we pick men, presumably, who have the ability. They're all going to be paid by us in the long run. Yeah. They? But the they're taxpayer given, yeah. pays it. They're given long tenure, they're given independence, uh, and the whole point of it is that they're expected to act independent, with independence. And I think, uh, from what I could see of the trial, that that was the case with, Har with Harrigan and Hatfield. Yeah, I have no complaint about that. Yeah. Go ahead from Esquimalt. Hello, Jack. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hey, Peggy Watt, we came out to Canada the same year, 1940. Oh, make your point. This is not a, a, a Scotch program this morning. Said. Right, Peggy, what do you want to ask about? Any citizens can lay a charge. Would he please tell us more about this? Oh, yeah. I knew that that would raise <laughs> eyebrows here because really? citizens who attempt to lay charges in this city of Vancouver ha often have considerable difficulty and they have to really? go before a JP who will hold a little hearing and decide if a charge should be laid. Is that the right procedure? Yes. That's correct. So I can't just go down and lay a charge. I must show that I have a cause for a charge and appear in front of a JP and yeah. produce my witnesses. That's right. But it's not the JP's function to screen it unless you're not kind of complying with the requirement that you allege that an offense has been committed. But if you allege that you have reasonable grounds to believe that an offense has been committed, uh, he is not there to try the case. I can quote you a good case in point, and that was outside the Seaforth Armouries in Vancouver a number of years ago. Yeah. When Mr. Trudeau was accused of belting an obnoxious character who came up to him. Yeah. And that obnoxious character went down and attempted to lay a charge against Mr. Trudeau. It was held, held, held by a JP who refused to issue the summons. I see. Well, there are, a few, um, there are a few offenses that you need to have the Attorney General's approval for. For example, hate literature charges. But you also need common sense. I mean, you can't yeah. let every... If yeah. everybody was a fancy insult go down and lay a charge, uh, the courts would be full with thousands of them. Well, but the, the safeguard on that is that the Crown w won't necessarily carry the charge. Go ahead, know. please. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Kaplan. Morning. My question uh, is maybe a little off uh, the course here, but uh, it's in regards to warrants that are uh, issued uh, um, in a province and they don't go right across Canada so uh, we get uh, criminals coming out here to Vancouver and that and uh, with no power to arrest them. Is there going to be anything uh, ever done about this uh, situation and I'll hang up and uh, wait for your answer. Yeah. Well I know that there are some problems and that uh, one of the issues for example is whether the requesting police force is willing to pay the expenses of bringing the fugitive back to their jurisdiction. Like if they issue a nationwide warrant uh, the first thing that the police force that has the person in their jurisdiction will look at is whether Toronto, for example, has agreed to pay the expenses of bringing this character back. And uh, it, is, it is an area that could use a bit of attention because as the Canadian population becomes more mobile, especially bank robbers, you know, bank robbers uh, nowadays will come from where they live just for the day. You know, they oh, come, no. oh, case it in the morning, yeah. make their hit in the afternoon, and then they'll head back to where they came from. That was and, done in Vancouver, yeah. and they were caught at the airport. They just whipped in, did the banks, I think yeah. they did two banks, and then they dropped a submachine gun or something out in the yeah. open, and the Mounties caught them at the airport. Yeah, we believe there have been some contract killings that way too, where people have come up from the States to do the killing and to just go right back to the States. You're in a so, province where there are lots of contract killings, but fortunately it's generally among their own kind, yeah. which at least is some... I tell you, this is laws. one of the great things about having the RCMP, because the R with the RCMP it's not an issue. You know, they, uh, 
They, they just do that as part of the normal accommodation. So in a province like mine, where we don't have the Mounties as our provincial police force, or in Quebec where they don't, and we don't have them in any of the municipalities, we're at a kind of a disadvantage in that area. So it's a good item for further attention. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, uh, two questions. One to Mr. Kaplan and one to you, Jack. Uh, <laughs> the one to Mr. Uh, Kaplan is uh, in regards to the national defense, uh, I was listening to John Turner yesterday and him again today. What national defense is that he's talking about? The three destroyers that will sink off our coast with bad boilers. And uh, the other question to you, Jack, if you don't hang up on me, give me a chance, is uh, I'm a cripple. Uh, I was attacked on the street a year ago uh, with a baseball bat and uh, when the hookers were still in the West End. And yet, a month ago, I sent you a registered letter, which, of course, I cannot afford. And uh, I didn't even receive one sentence reply that you, uh, uh, and both, uh, both the president of the corporation and a man from the union looked at the letter and said the idea was good on the food bank and made sense and maybe we could help other people. I had nothing to... Came by the cashier's desks and uh, to market it in a way that uh, that makes people. Uh, well, I didn't. Did you ever read it yourself, Jack? Uh, let me tell you something. I read your letter. We did an item on the program called "That's a Fair Question." We put the question from your letter up on the air, and I gave a 90-second answer saying what the major department stores are doing. I'm sorry I didn't write you an answer, but I dealt with the topic on the air, and I'll dish it out, and I'll mention it again during the latter half of the program. Take his phone number. Thank goodness, because there's so many letters I don't answer. I was quite uh -huh. prepared to be sorely embarrassed. Last call to Bob Kaplan. Go ahead, please. I'd like to thank Mr. Kaplan for coming on the program. He's an education to us, but most important, he's an education to the Tories. You'll see reaction when they make their next statements. And the same applies to John Turner. Thank them both very much, Jack, for having them on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, you. Your charisma this morning has been well, yeah. very friendly, and you well, didn't I, raise any of the hate mail. I don't know if it's charisma or karma. <laughs> Maybe it's karma. <laughs> Maybe it's karma. <laughs> That's you, what you're supposed to have out here in D.C. You do seem more react, more <laughs> relaxed than when you were Solicitor General? Yeah, no, there's a lot less stress to being in the opposition, but it's still an important job. Uh, by this time next week, will you, will you have dropped the whole McKay affair? No, I don't think we can, unless they change the policy of holding meetings. Or unless uh, McKay admits his culpability in yeah, what right. you regard as an improper attitude. That's right. My thanks to Bob Kaplan. Next to Free For All with Webster after the break. Ah, we're going to have a free-for-all from now on. That was a fairly soft session with Bob Kaplan. I don't know whether it was me or it was him or if it was just a different set of callers this morning. I confidently expected he'd get in all kinds of trouble. So I'm not really organized for this free-for-all. I have a couple of things I want to talk about. I want to talk about chiropractors' preventive... If chiropractors are billing for preventive services and you are claiming it from the MSP, you're not supposed to watch it. The same applies to all preventive services uh, if under the medical services plan. They are not covered. Go ahead, please. Hi, Jack. Hi. Happy Valentine's to you. Lots of us love you. Good. I missed Mr. Kaplan. I thought he had excellent poise for a critic. He was quite good. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up the issue that uh, perhaps, uh, as Mr. Kaplan said, them discussing the issue of whether the Solicitor General acted appropriately and not discussing Mr. Hatfield's marijuana charge, perhaps that's showing the uh, hypocrisy of uh, Canada's marijuana laws. Are you another user? No, sir. Well, why are you on talking about hypocrisy? You obviously are a user, aren't you? You got me. How much do you use? How much do you use? Or are you too stoned? I don't want it in weight or... No, how many joints do you smoke a day? Oh, one or two. What does it cost you? Nothing, I grow it. Oh, do you grow it hydroponically? No, no, just in dirt. 
but you have lights on it all the time. Yes, I do. And uh, what's your plant worth? How much do you sell? None. Oh, it's just for yourself and your wife and your kids. And dad. Oh, dad. And don't forget old dad. <laughs> and uh, what age do you start encouraging the kids to smoke pot? Not at all. Not at all. Oh, but they're going to grow up as pot smokers, aren't they? Possibly. Do you know what day this is? February 15th. Good. 1983. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Good boy. <laughs> now we'll never know if he was joking or not. Because <laughs> I've noticed heavy pot smokers, you know. Hey, hey, where are you from? Huh? Everywhere. Here and now. Huh? Huh? What dopes they are. Oh, they're pathetic. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Morning, Jack. Morning. Uh, see, why, is, why are you getting all these marijuana stoners and pot dealers calling you the, you know, the past little while here or something? Well, like they're guys. acting like they're discriminated against or mean, hunted down like criminals. Well, they should be. They're criminals. It's against the law. But more importantly, you know, if only the governments would tackle drinking and driving as seriously as they do this marijuana issue, you know, even half as hard. Uh, you know, governments, both provincial and federal, seem to be dragging their feet on this uh, drinking and driving. To think that you could, uh, you know, kill somebody and maybe all you could face is just maybe a year's suspended sentence, maybe a thousand dollar fine. You know, if I wanted to murder somebody, I think that would be the perfect cover to maybe follow the guy to some bar and uh, watch him drink along with him, and then, hey, when he leaves, I'll go outside and I'll just mow him over with my motor vehicle. Uh, I'll tell you how they could stop drinking and driving right now, and uh, you're all yellow-bellied, lily-livered, and all the rest of it. If you are involved in any blame in the death of an individual, you get six months in the bucket. Well, no, it should be even tougher. And, you know, they, they say the criminal code on one of your shows uh, a little earlier, one of the uh, one of your guests were saying, well, the criminal code provides for a fine of up to $2,000. The judges never impose it. It's only a $500 fine most of the time. Well, they should, is... you know, if you gave a, a $10,000 fine or you put up somebody in jail for two years, the drinking and driving would be non-existent. Nobody would dare take the chance, and they're just too scared to, to do it because they want all their tax profits out of it. And also suspend the right to drive in this country for the rest of the natural days. Well, something similar along those lines, I'm mm. sure. You know, they, they don't take nearly as serious a stand as that with, as with other things. I know. It's, a, it's really quite comic opera, the whole business. No, I agree with you almost entirely on that. Especially, Great show, Jack. Especially yeah. now that I don't drink. In fact, no, I don't drink and I was always pretty cautious. But now I can get into my car, fasten my seatbelt, and say, well, I can drive any way I like. I haven't got alcohol in my breath. Well, great show anyway, Jack. Yeah, uh, she's not a pot smoker. I wonder if all the pot smokers in Vancouver watch me. Hey, Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Mr. Webster. I found Mr. Capelin to be a gentleman far from being a seas bag, and I'd like, I would like to uh, voice my... Uh, my views this morning on Mr. Monroe McKay and Coates in Hatfield, Mr. Fox. It'll take only a minute. Um, Go on. Yes, uh, for uh, Mr. Fox, uh, misfortune was more like a speeding ticket compared to Hatfield's hit and run. I doubt if anyone would be uh, uh, would be looking to see if uh, any zippers were open or could remember when knowing a prime minister is in your establishment, you would mostly likely be trying to see him or meet him, never mind a suitcase. And with all the security around, I wonder how they could get into the airport manager's office where the suitcase was. And for Hatfield, being uh, his audacity to face the nation on TV uh, shows how low he'll, he could crawl, for only a person who has no principles or morals could believe a bachelor who goes to sex shops to get rubber dolls and sniffs or shoots cocaine. Wait a minute, uh, I don't know, but I, I know he's got a doll collection, but it's a perfectly proper doll collection. Let's not go hog wild on this. It's been said with perfect uh, reason that Disco Dick's lifestyle causes him trouble, but that's enough. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I have a picture here in 1977 and shows a picture of Mackay and two bugs, and Mackay paid $13,000 to two private eyes, and they found these two bugs 
which I what cost uh, exactly twenty dollars, and he paid them thirteen thousand dollars. They went to jail, and I always suspected that Mackay paid them to put them put them there. Do you think that Mackay planted them? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't I, know. I suspect that. And you you remember me, Jack? In 1952, I thought we caught the first four juvenile drug addicts. The reason for this is that uh, you asked Mackay who lays the charges. My, the, the, the mounted police, they have to always lay the charge. Well, uh, in those old days, those four juveniles, uh, our prosecutor downtown, the, the, the Mounties wouldn't lay the charges. And uh, the, the, um, in the end of the case, uh, finally, the, we went to the attorney general, uh, our, our prosecutor downtown went to the, the attorney general, and we laid, relayed the charges. The, he forced the Mounties to lay the charges, and they all got 10 years and 15 lashes. I just thought you'd like to know that. Are you an old friend of mine? Yeah, Angus McDonald. Angus, how are you? Not bad. What are you doing nowadays? Same old business. Same old business. Angus, give me a call sometime. Much obliged. Nice to talk to you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, hi, Jack. Hi, Jack. How are you? Fine. I'm not a pot smoker, Jack, but I think if I used the new nickname for Vancouver and told them that I came from the world in a city, people would probably think I was stoned. <laughs> think about that. That's the most terrible title for Vancouver and Expo, isn't it? It definitely is, and I'll tell you something else, Jack. I'm really upset about it because they were advertising this competition as a nickname. Uh-huh. Referring to the Big Apple. Uh-huh. Where do you get a nickname from? As far as I'm concerned, this is a slogan. And I think that probably 90% of the people, of the 10,000 entries that entered the contest, had in mind the name nickname, uh, had a one-liner as opposed to a slogan. You're correct. You're correct, you're correct, you're correct. Now, hold on a second. Don't go away. I've got to speak to Murphy's Mountain. Now, stay there. Okay. Is that your... Doreen, are you there? No, this isn't Doreen. This is a relative of. Are you speaking from Murphy's Mountain? No, I'm actually speaking uh, in Vancouver right now. I've just come back from Murphy's Mountain. Have they plowed the road? Uh, no, there's no change, there's no nothing. This is Hold on, you're for. not important. Where was that one? Four. I'll go back to that woman immediately after the break. Yeah, I agree with you entirely that the Vancouver, a world within a city, is a clumsy, unattractive slogan. It's a nick slogan. It's far too long, and it's not a nickname. What was your suggestion? The Sunset City. No, that means death. No, come on. We have beautiful sunsets in Vancouver. No, but the point is I'm not concerned about what I put in. The point that I'd like to make is the fact that I think they deliberately misled the public. I mean, a slogan, as far as a slogan is concerned, people would probably say something like the uh, West Side is the best side. Yeah. Now, if somebody calls me a nickname, I hope it's a shorter version of my name and something that people are going to remember me by for years to come. I think you're just destroying... Nobody's going to use that anyway, a world within a city. It's clumsy. That's it. If, if I go back home and tell them I, live, I come from the world in a city, they're going to ask me where it is. Ask you what you're snorting up your nose. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and the only snort thing I snort up my nose, nose these days is Vicks because I've had a really bad cold. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't get very high on Vic, they tell me. <laughs> okay, I, the only thing I snort down my nose is indignation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Okay, hi, Jack. Hi. Uh, I'd like to ask you, do you know what the uh, prolonged uh, effects of uh, pot, coke, etc. is? Well, I know the pro prolonged effects of marijuana. I remember I had some musician friends 20 years ago who had very bad emphysema, which was blamed on the cons consistent smoking of marijuana, which has got even more loose fibers kicking around, I do believe, than tobacco, ordinary tobacco. Okay, how and about paranoia? I, well, no, I'm paranoid without ever having smoked pot, but oh, I do... Dick, Patch, uh, Dick ha uh, Hatfield, is he paranoid? The statement yesterday contained a touch of something very close to paranoia, but my own secret suspicion is that that was crafted by Dalton Camp. Uh, and the attitudes were such that one would think 
it was an incredible statement. But I will not draw long bows or long sniffs either. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Why not call Vancouver what it is? Pacific Playground or Pacific Paradise or something like that? Yeah, that's quite good, except that I'd like to see something which has got a Canadian ring to it, because Pacific Paradise is anywhere from Malibu Beach. No, nah, it doesn't compare. Hey, I just came back from, from California last summer, Jack. No, I'm talking about the name. I'm talking about the name. It's, you really got to get Pacific Paradise. It's a hell of a lot better than the world within a city, I'll tell you that. Pacific Playground. You know. Pacific Playground. I'll tell you what I got. I consider it. Well, I, when I came into Vancouver 10 years ago, um, if, you ever lost, if you've ever read Lost Horizon, I, I found my Shangri-La. I hope it's not on pot you found it. No, on pot. Oh, jeez. Oh, you know, why does everybody have to... I've smoked it for 20 years, Jack, and I'll say one thing. It's like booze. What one person can handle can really whack out the other. And if you give, an, if you give a madman uh, any kind of a drug, of course he'll get madder. But, I, uh, I think that's very well said, and we'll leave it to that. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. The reason for my call is that nothing was said uh, to Mr. Kaplan regarding the Clifford Olson case of the payoff with the RCMP. Also, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more about the Chiropractic Association. You just mentioned something. I'd like to hear more about it. Okay. Now, if you'll hold on, I'll do that after I take this telephone call. Is that Doreen Harder from Murphy's Mountain? Good morning, Jack. Now, you phoned me yesterday morning on the air, and now news hour whipped up there yesterday afternoon to helicopter and did a very good report on how you are being totally neglected by a disinterested, cold-blooded uh, highways department at Lillooet and in Victoria. Have you seen any sign of the snow plows yet? Not a thing has changed. It's exactly the same as it was. I haven't got a phone call from anybody or heard from anybody or nothing. Well, I saw I saw on our coverage last night that your old snow that your own plow is fouled up at the side of the road, and all I can do is ask anyone who is within uh, touch with Alex Fraser, the Minister of Highway, to tell him that if something goes wrong in your community and he hasn't made an effort to help you, he will carry the total responsibility. So, Alex, whatever you are, for God's sake, send in a snow plow. One run a week would do it, wouldn't it, Doreen? Oh, your one run a month would do it. I don't know. Are you sure you haven't annoyed someone or said something nasty about social credit? No, I've been really careful and nice. <laughs> okay, darling, phone me again Monday if you're still snowed in. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye. Now, let me tell you about the chiropractors. I read some letters the other day on the, tele on the television which have been sent out by a chiropractor in Kamloops whose name is chiropractor Dr. Michael James. Dear patient, we've been missing you. Why don't you come in for a spinal checkup or whatever? And I pointed out, and I spoke to the chiropractor at the time, that this is preventive medicine, and that if he has opted out of the scheme, and if any of his patients collect money for what turns out to be a preventive treatment, they're going to have to give it back to the medical services plan. And the Chiropractic Association, after my broadcast, and the Ministry of Health are now, I am told, investigating these letters sent out by this Kamloops chiropractor. Unfortunately, the spokesman in the, in the Vancouver Sun does not explain the reason for the investigation. The reason for the investigation is that if these letters are asking people to come in for preventive treatment, and they are getting preventive treatment, and that the patients are claiming it from the plan, they'll have to give the money back. Preventive treatments are not covered by the plan. And I understand from Keith Hancock for the chiropractors that there is going to be a hearing, that the Dr. Michael James will probably be at the hearing, and that they will tell me the result of their investigation, and I shall, of course, keep in touch with the Ministry of Health. Go ahead, please. Hi, Jack. Hi. Uh, can you recall what the uh, so-called concentration camp legislation was that passed in 1982 under the Liberal government? Yes, it was 1982. I think it was prior to that. It was a, an Emergency Measures Act which allowed the government to set up camps under, I think there were civilian control 
to put in any problem citizens of the country in times of emergency. It was just as simple as that. That sounds pretty dangerous, doesn't it? Well, I don't know. I'm not paranoid about these things. Governments must have legislation to act in the case of a nuclear holocaust if there's anybody left to round up who's left and attempt to look after them. That's not one of the things about which I am paranoid or have fears. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Jack, I'm a little disappointed that Vancouver never used my suggestion for the name. What of the was city. yours? I'd like to be here be called Never Never Land. You've got MLAs who are never here, you've got teachers who are never happy, fishermen who are never happy, loggers who are never happy, bus drivers who are never happy, and union leaders who are never happy. That's right, and but one thing about the MLA is they don't have to live on the Never Never. They just took themselves in this time of restraint a very healthy, a healthy thank you very much, more money. The NDPers are going to grab it just as quick as the Socreds. Yeah. Thanks for your call. Never Never Land is a good title. Lotus Land is even better. I'll be back after the break. Monday morning, we're going to take you on a very special report of a chase through the streets of Vancouver on high-speed mobile pickets in a long-standing labor dispute. It'll curl your hair. 9 a.m. precisely. And really, it's beyond my <laughs> comprehension. I didn't know so many pot smokers listened to Webster. So early in the morning, too, yeah. Jack. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, please. How <laughs> many if family have you got? I've got three boys. Oh, I've just got three girls and I one boy. I see. Oh, well. I didn't do as well as you in that no, department. No, no. Merithew. Merithew. Is he bright? Yes, he is. Is he a Tory? Yes, he is. Does that go together? <laughs> <laughs> and to you too, happy Valentine's Day, that's all. Uh, just a minute, just a minute. How dare you use my program to wish people happy Valentine's? Well. Somebody's phoned in there lots of times on your programs and never ever got the right answer that they wanted to, so I think it's... Well, I'm not going to say to you, be my love, who's your dolly and Prince Rupert you're trying to c communicate on the cheap with? Liberal Bob Kaplan attacks McKay on check at midnight. 